guess I've outgrown it. But that doesn't mean that I don't believe that there's something bigger than me. Cause I've seen it in the hospital room when the doctor said sorry. And there's nothing more we can do. But it wasn't true. And I've never seen a particle at the end of the rainbow. But I got a promise I can hope in the middle of the struggle. And God, if you said it, your performing may not be how I want you to. But here's what I'll do. I'm going to wait on you. I'm going to wait on you. Yes, Lord. I've tasted your goodness. I trust in your promise. I'm going to wait on you. Yeah. I'm going to wait on you. I've tasted your goodness. Trust in your promise. I'm going I'm gonna wait. 
what happens when you act. That's what happens when you act. Come on. Then I wait on the Lord. Say, then I wait. On the Lord. Hey. Shall we do? Hey. They'll stay up. They shall mount up. Up on wings. Hey. Like an eagle. Yeah. So I. That's how I. And I get where I am. They shall rise. And I say. That's what happens when you act. So you get a little stronger. That's what happens when you wait. They say you get a little stronger. That's what happens when you wait. That's what happens when you wait. Say you get a little stronger. You get a little stronger. Hey, that's what happens when you wait. That's what happens when you wait. You get a little stronger. 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 Hallelujah, hallelujah. As I wait on the Lord, as I wait on the Lord, this has been my personal, my 
personal theme for the year, waiting on the Lord. I'm still throwing my weight on the Lord. So as we wait on the Lord right now, he's going to renew our strength. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I just want to welcome everybody to another day of Solomon Assembly. Today is 1,225 days. We have been meeting at this holy mountain of prayer. And we thank God that you are here with us today. We thank God for the people who started 1,225 days ago and the people who started yesterday. Everybody, we thank you for being on with us another day. It is only through God we are here today because we have been waiting on God for 1,225 days. If I got to wait another 1,225 days, God, I am putting my weight on you. So now, not am I only putting my physical, my not only waiting on him in the temple time, but I'm putting my weight on him as well. So all the burdens, everything that carries me down, everything that weighs me down, God, I'm giving it all to you today. I'm giving it all to you. While I'm waiting on you, God, I'm still going to put my burdens, my weight, my everything that I've been carrying on with you right now, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I just want to open up in prayer. First, give an honor to God, who is the head of my life, and to my pastor, Apostle Dr. Robert L. Black and Lady Stacey Black. Uh, <clears throat> Um, let's start and open up in prayer. God, we thank you today. We thank you for another day we have been, you've given us breath. God, we thank you for your loving kindness, for keeping us through every toil and every danger that we have not yet seen, God, for everything you kept us from, from every accident that went past us today, from everything that you sent your angels around us to keep us, to present a hedge around us, God. We thank you today. God, we ask you for a new anointed one more time. God, I'm asking you to, to touch Dr. Shanika Bullens right now. God, I'm asking you to flow through her right now, that every word that comes through her mouth, God, that you put it in. God, we ask that you be the mouthpiece today, God. God, I'm asking you to touch Dr. Shanika Bullens and her family right now. God, anoint them one more time. Put their oils around their heads one more time. God, we honor you today, God. We give you the grace. God, God, we give you the honor. God, we love you. Hallelujah. In your name we pray. Hallelujah. Today, I just want to um, read a short scripture. I'm not going to be long because the one of God is here. And I'll tell you, I love this woman of God. I've heard her speak a couple of times, but every time she speaks, it blesses me. Um, and I can't wait to get to California so I can meet personally with her and her husband because I love them. I love them. I love them already. Um, today, I'm going to be speaking from Matthew 10, verses 1 through 4. And it says, And when he called unto him his twelve disciples, and he gave them the power against unclean spirits, to cast them out, and to heal all manners of sickness and all manner of disease. Now the names of the twelve are those are these, the first, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the publican, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Libius, whose surname is Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who will also betray him. So I'm not going to go too deep into it, but there's a reason why Jesus only had 12 disciples. You see, when you have 12 disciples, you're able to impart into them. It's not always about the size of your crowd. It's not always about who's, how much people are following you, but how much can you impart into those following? Can you give into that today? Can you impart it to people? Don't worry about the everybody else. Worry about what God has given you. If your, smoke, your circle's only 12, use that 12. If your circle's only two, use that two. So today, today, today. Don't worry about the size of your crowd. If God has given you somebody to disciple, put in part everything into them that you could possibly be. If it is one person, use that. Don't worry about the size of your crowd. So right there, I'm going to leave it right there. Hallelujah. Right now, I'm going to open up the testimony lines. If you have a burning testimony, the floor is open. Hallelujah. God 
bless you. Hi, solemn assembly. Holy, holy, holy greetings and the precious name of Jesus. Truly, I magnify the Lord today because he has done great things for me. Hi, whereof I am glad. You know the song said, I am waiting on Jesus. And I'm waiting and he's blessing me right now, saints. I said, right now, he's watching me, he's charging me, he's using me for his son and glory. And I thank God for his grace and mercy. I thank God that I have been on 1,225 days. I thank God for sparing my life, Mother blessed life, that I can be on and magnify the name of Jesus. Because he is worthy, say God is worthy to be praised. And I thank God that I can praise him. I give him all the honor. I give God all the glory because great things he has done for me. Nobody know what God has done for me, but I know. I can tell you God is a good God. He's a way maker. He's a burden bearer. He's a keeper. He'll take you through storms when storms are raging and billows are tossing high. I can run to that rock, and that rock is Jesus. And I thank God that I know him as my personal Savior. I just thank God for everything. God bless every one of you all. I am praying for you. I thank God our God is blessing my son, uh, Apostle Robert Black. I thank God for sparing my life that I can see his handiwork in my children. Oh, God, I thank you. I thank you. Because God has done great things. He has brought us from a mighty long way. And I give him all the honor and glory. And you pray. Pray for Mother Black. Because I need Jesus. I say I need him every step of the way. God reads the very belly of my heart. And he know that I want to serve him and live for him. So pray for me as I continue to pray for you all in Jesus' name. God bless you all. I love you all in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God bless you. God bless you, Grandma Black. We love you even more. Hallelujah. So right now we are at an important time of the service. We have Dr. Shanika Bullens, this woman of God, this woman of God who can preach down strongholds. Hallelujah. So right now the floor is yours. Hallelujah. Greetings and praise the Lord to everybody. Um, Mother Black, I love you, woman of God. Every time I hear your voice, it encourages me. So thank you for staying on the wall and continuing to be an encouraging force for the people of God, just reminding us about the goodness and the mercy of God. You are a living witness that God is good and God will preserve our days if we would just trust in him. Thank God for Mother Black. Uh, Pastor Jermaine, I thank God for you, sir. Thank you um, for facilitating us tonight. I honor our fearless leaders, our visionaries of Total Worship Center, those who have um, given us this space and this platform for Solemn Assembly. Um, we honor Apostle Dr. Robert Black, First Lady Stacy Black. Thank you and God bless you. We love you. We thank God for you. Thank you to everybody tuning in tonight. I want to tell you all this word that I have tonight. Um, I don't I don't know which hat I'm going to wear, uh, wear the best tonight. Um, but the, the, the teacher in me um, has been ignited. The Lord was very intentional with me. I had something completely different plan. And the Lord said, nope, that's not it. He told me tonight, he said, I want you to teach my people how to be delivered from the stronghold of fear. So my presentation tonight, you all, is a little less traditional. And I thank God that our apostle has given me the, the, the thumbs up and the go ahead to be a little less traditional. And I'm actually going to present my content in the form of a, a Google Slides presentation, because I want you guys to take this information and I want you to chew on it. I want you to um, come back to it. I want you to spend time with it because the Lord has the intention 
of delivering us from the stronghold of fear in Jesus' name. Um, uh, Brother Jermaine, if you are able to, sir, pastor, excuse me, please forgive me. Pastor, yes, thank you. Okay, so my presentation is down on the screen, and I have been putting the link in the chat for you all. So please do, um, please do click on the link and it will force you to make a copy of this presentation to where you will have access to this content for yourself. If you want it after, reach out to me, I'll email it to you, I'll text it to you, however you need it, I'll get it into your hands. But I promise you all, the Lord has, um, he has the intention of us being delivered from the stronghold of fear, starting right now in Jesus name. I want to jump directly into the word of God. I'm going to read from 2 Corinthians, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation. And the word reads, we are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. I like this particular um, uh, uh, translation, right? And I, I, I enjoy the New Living Translation because, again, it speaks to us in a way that is very easily comprehensible, right? So it's telling us, we're, we use God's mighty weapons. We're not waging war as humans. We're not fighting wrestling against flesh and blood, it tells us in the New King James, right? So we use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. So do we understand that our fight, right? Our fight is not physical. Our fight is we have to employ God's weapons in order to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle, right? This is an emotional state that keeps people from knowing God. Every emotional state that keeps us from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. So I have to submit my emotions. I have to submit my thoughts. I have to submit my human reasoning. I have to submit my arguments and teach them to obey Christ. Why is this the preface of what God is telling us in this season? Because if I understand that I have a call, a, a command to speak to those things that are trying to separate me in relationship from God on an emotional, mental, logical level, then I can understand the stronghold of fear. I want to ask y'all this very challenging question. Have you ever met a child that didn't have a dream? Maybe this is not your story, but I am going into my 17th year in the classroom. And when I tell you all one of the most heartbreaking, gut-wrenching conversations I have with children, and I work with teenagers, I work at the high school level primarily, one of the most gut-wrenching conversations I have with children is when I say, what do you want to do when you graduate? And they say, I don't know. And I say, wait, you don't want to be a doctor, a lawyer, a teacher? No. What do you want to do? And they have no answer. How in the world does a child reach the age of transitioning quickly into adulthood with no dream? I'm going to tell you why. I need us to first understand how our brains work. The reason why, y'all, I had to make this presentation is because, again, I need y'all to sit with this. I need y'all to chew on this. And I need us to understand how our brains work. Because then you're going to understand this question that I'm posing about, why a child, how a child could reach the point of near adulthood and not have a dream, okay? First, we got to understand how our brain works. So this image shows us three segments of our brain. Our brain is broken down into the prefrontal cortex, the amygdala, and the hippocampus. The prefrontal cortex of our brain is the decision-making part of our brain, and it's responsible for our ability to plan, to think about the consequences of actions so we can easily put together cause and effect relationships. Because y'all know that's a big deal as adults, right? If I do this, this is what's going to happen, which, which usually influences and informs a lot of the decisions that we make, right? And stops us from being so hasty because I know that if I do this, it's going to lead to that. It also helps us to solve problems, control impulses, and also regulate emotions. We also refer to these as executive function skills. And these are the skills that we have developed as adults in order to allow us to actually survive and ultimately thrive in the world. This is how we learn to pay our bills when they're due. This is how we've learned to try to maintain some, some semblance of good credit. This is how we've gone to apply for vehicles and get car loans and mortgages and things of that nature because our prefrontal cortex works optimally. Then we have the amygdala. The amygdala is the organ that is responsible for processing and expressing our emotions, especially the emotions of anger and fear. 
And our amygdala is constantly on the lookout for danger. It's like our smoke detector, right? When there's smoke in the house because there's a fire, smoke detector goes off and it's trying to alert individuals there is danger. Take action. So our amygdala is our smoke detector that tells us take action. So when we feel threatened, when we feel endangered, the smoke detector is going off and telling us to take action. There's something we need to do in order to get ourselves out of the danger. Our hippocampus, it plays a critical role in the formation, organization, and storage of new memories. And it connects certain sensations and emotions to these memories. For example, have you all you know, thought about Thanksgiving dinner? And it's like we almost can smell ourselves sitting at the table. You know, we got auntie who's going to bring her yams and we got, you know, granny who's going to make her turkey and somebody's going to grill this. And so and we can like smell it. Right. We can go back to that place. So connecting my emotions to those experiences and those memories is the result of a well-functioning hippocampus. So there are scents and experiences we have had right that trigger memories. Now, why is it important for us to understand these three parts of our brain? Because. When these three parts of our brain experience trauma, they do not function optimally. What does this mean? This means that when we have undergone trauma, that my experience affects my behaviors. So if I've undergone traumatic experiences, I'm going to behave in a way that is indicative of the trauma that I have experienced. Now, this lens of care, it provides an opportunity for people to regain a sense of control. So many of us don't recognize how common trauma is. Trauma is not a small issue. So many of us have battled with trauma, primary and secondary trauma. And what happens is when we go to, as an educator, right, we, I've become trained in trauma-informed education. And I've worked at schools that have been trauma-informed sites because what they want us to know is that trauma is common. Trauma influences behaviors. When kids are acting out, it is not because they are bad. It's because they are traumatized and they don't know how to cope with the after effects of the trauma. So then they have to also emphasize to us that we don't just focus on the fact that the students are coming in with trauma. We have to also remember that they're coming in with strengths with perspectives, with experiences outside of the trauma that is valuable. We call this their capital. So, so learners come into our classrooms with capital and we have to learn how to utilize their capital to help them to combat and overcome their trauma. That's the only way that we can be effective for them and to them in attempting to educate them. But we have to remember, number one, trauma is common. And I can't help somebody if their focus is always on the trauma and not on the healing, okay? So let's go forward. What happens when I've undergone trauma? How does trauma affect our brain? So when, we, when we're in this negative emotional state, you all, when we're stressed out, when we're anxious, when we're fearful, the amygdala is literally sucking in all of our brain juice. That's the best way I'm gonna explain it. All efforts are flowing to the amygdala which means I have less flow to the prefrontal cortex and less flow to the hippocampus. So because I'm blocking flow and energy and oxygen from going to the prefrontal cortex, I have no emotional regulation. I have limited emotional regulation. It's hard for me to think rationally and make rational decisions. It's hard for me to prioritize or organize. It's hard for me to think on a higher level. The prefrontal cortex is where our higher level thinking skills derive from. If I have limited blood supply to my hippocampus because it's all flowing to the amygdala, then I'm not able to even recall memories. This is why some people, we think, you know, oh man, if I was in a dangerous situation, I would do X, Y, and Z. Chances are probably not. Many of us would fall to the ground, run somewhere and think we're hiding in a place that we are very visible because it is very difficult for us to remember certain skill sets that we have learned when all of our blood is flowing to the amygdala. We learn things like how to check when a, a stroke patient is having a stroke, right? We learn these kind of things. And then when it comes time to put them into practice, it's like, what, what, what? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Because 
all of our blood flow is going to the amygdala. So if I have minimal blood flow to the prefrontal cortex and minimal blood flow to the hippocampus and maximum blood flow to the amygdala, what does that mean? So my amygdala is now working hyper overtime. And so that means that my amygdala, which is responsible for my emotional state and my survival instincts, I'm now in hyper survival mode. That means that my fear levels are through the roof. My stress levels are through the roof. My irritation is through the roof. My anger is through the roof. I can't calm down. I can't sleep. I'm battling with insomnia. I'm trying to help somebody today. And I'm dealing with all of these experiences as a result of all of my energy and flow going to my amygdala. If you wonder why you can't sleep at night, it is probably because you have been in an elongated state of amygdala, um, um, what's the word, Am amygdala irritation, hyperactivity of the amygdala, because we've been in survival mode for so very long. So when we meet people who are always angry and negative and restless and impulsive, these are the behaviors of individuals who have lived in constant states of trauma. Somebody understand that trauma is common. Somebody type it in the chats. Trauma is common. I got to speak to the whole man because if we make everything in the, in the sun, moon, and stars and in tongues and people are running around here with trauma, they're going to continue to leave our church services broken. They're going to continue to leave our spaces of worship with no true transformative change. But God is calling us to dismantle our relationship with fear in Jesus' mighty name. So now that we have this understanding of trauma, it now makes sense how a child can go through an educational experience for more than 10, 11, 12 years reaching adulthood and having a struggle about what it is they want to do with their life. Why is this? Because they've lived in a state of an irritated, hyperactive amygdala for so long that they cannot engage in rational thinking. How can they think about what tomorrow holds when they're barely surviving through today? I can't get no help in here, and that's okay. Lord, help us anyway. We as the saints of God, you all, we have an obligation to provide God's people with trauma-informed care. I'm going to say that again. I'm going to say that again because I need that to get it to somebody's spirit today. We have an obligation to provide God's people with trauma-informed care. It is time for us to empower people to destroy the stronghold of fear. I don't have to live bound to fear any longer. I've actually been reading this book by Pastor Joyce Meyer called Do It Afraid. I've been reading this book for quite a few weeks at this point. And one thing that Pastor Joyce Meyer admonishes us to do is she tells us it's not that we won't ever be afraid. She says, when we are afraid, we still do it afraid because we have to understand some things about fear. So I'm going to come back to 2 Timothy and I'm going to talk about how the Apostle Paul wrote this epistle to this young pastor, Timothy, and how he encouraged him to overcome fear and to do it afraid. So. What is fear? Let's define fear. Fear is an int a basic intense emotion that's aroused by the detection of an imminent threat that involves an immediate alarm reaction that mobilizes the organism by triggering a set of physiological changes, right? And we're going to talk about what those physiological changes are because some of us believe that when we're afraid, it only looks one way. And I'm, I'm, I'm up against that demon today as well. We're going to pull out all, we're going to let the devil know that we're aware of all of his tricks in this season in Jesus name. So another definition of fear is that fear is an unpleasant emotion caused by the belief that someone or something is dangerous, likely to cause pain or a threat. The verb of fear, when I fear, I am afraid of someone or something that I consider to be likely, I consider likely to be dangerous, painful or threatening. Okay, so let's get into this. Now that I understand fear, what's the polar opposite of fear? Courage, right? So what is courage? Well, when we define courage, we often think that courage is the absence of fear. In reality, courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is moving forward in the presence of fear. So yes, I am afraid, but I'm going to do it afraid. Somebody lay hands on themselves and say, I'm going to do it 
afraid. Type it in the chat. I'm going to do it afraid. Let the devil know that he will no longer keep us bound by fear. I don't have to get over the fear. I'm going to do this thing afraid. I'm going to do what God called me to do afraid. I'm going to move forward in my anointing afraid. I'm going to serve in my church afraid. I'm going to sing that song afraid. I'm going to preach that message afraid. I'm going to do it afraid. Why? Because God has not given me a spirit of fear, but he's given me a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. We're going to get into it, y'all. That's 2 Timothy. I'm going to get into it. I'm going to get into it. I'm going to do it afraid. I don't know what your it is tonight, saints of God, huh? but it's time for us to tell the devil that he has had his foot on our neck for far too long, and I'm not going to be blocked, and I'm not going to be stopped by your agenda. Not one more day. It's time for me to do it afraid in Jesus' name. Courage defined as strength in the face of pain or grief. Understand that courage when God told Joshua in the book of Joshua chapter one, when he told him to be not afraid, nor be thou dismayed. He did not say, Joshua, don't feel fear. He said, when you feel fear, understand that I've given you the strength to do it in the face of the pain and the grief and the fear. So it is time for us to understand that I can do this thing even with the fear. A Carly Wilson Baker has a poem called Courage. And in her poem, Courage, she writes, Courage is fear that has said its prayers. My God, courage is fear that has said its prayers. And then Pastor Joyce Meyer finishes the statement and says, and gone forward to do what it was asked to do. I'm going to do it afraid. If you didn't have your chance to say it yet, go ahead and say it again. I'm going to do it afraid. Why am I going to do this thing afraid, you all? Because... I'm going to learn to recognize when fear is at play, when the enemy is guising um, my anger and my frustration and all these other emotions as fear, and they're distracting me from my purpose. There are four fear responses, you all. Fight, flight, freeze, and fawn. The fight response is this idea that I want to be right. So what I'm going to do is I will engage in argument. I will... Um, be very aggressive. I will be, uh, will gaslight. I will not employ listening skills. And I might even engage in controlling behaviors because at the end of the day, I need to usurp some type of power over whatever it is that's causing me fear to make it seem as if I can overcome you. Now, in a situation where the fear is real and the, the imminent danger that's detected by the amygdala, when that's real, when that's real, right, this is a very effective tool to keep us safe. However, when the perceived danger is not actually a threat, this can get us into trouble. This is some of the reasons why some people have a problem submitting to authorities within our churches. Uh-oh, I said it. We struggle to submit to authority in the church because of the fight response. When we're afraid, we now need to usurp authority and let them know you don't have any control over me. Right? We, we turn into Tupac. Only God can judge me. Instead of saying, yes, Lord, and amen. Instead of with a grateful heart wanting to serve. Instead of wanting to surrender ourselves to the will of God. We got to somehow show that we have power over it. So we perceive danger right through that amygdala because some of us have lived in these, right, these heightened hyper states, um, these hyperactive states of, of our uh, irritated amygdala. And now we believe if pastor wants to correct me, sit me down, have a conversation with me about how I'm living, how I'm per uh, per uh, being portrayed on social media, I have an attitude. Okay, I'm not going to dig into it. I don't I don't want to ruffle no feathers. I don't want nobody to call me later and say that I was out of order. Uh, 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 Apostle, please forgive me. But I want us to understand that sometimes we perceive that there is danger and it's not really danger. And what it does is it gets us into trouble. So we got to get to the root of this thing. The reason why I can't submit to my leaders is because I'm afraid. Not because I'm angry. Not because they're wrong, not because they're trying to control, but because I'm trying to control, because I've spent so much time with things out of control that I don't know how to relinquish control. All right, I'm going to keep on going. I'm going to keep on going. What about when we get into flight? When I get into flight, what I'm basically saying is, I don't want to deal with this. So I'm going to run for the hills. Jonah is a great example of somebody who, in the face of fear, decided to run, right? I don't want to deal with this. We know how that story ends, but we have to watch and see what happens, right? What happens is the issues began to avalanche. The more we ignore them, the more we run from them, they avalanche, right? It's like sweeping it under that rug, right? That proverbial, proverbial rug. Or we put the issues off 
We don't want to talk about it or we try to focus on perfectionism, right? Because I got to put on the right mask. People need to be able to see that I'm saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost filled, huh? With the evidence of speaking in tongues as the spirit gives utterance, ha, ta, 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 right? Because I don't want nobody to know that my child, I just found out that my child is doing drugs or I just found out that my husband is not being faithful or I just found out that somebody's, I got I to just put on my mask. So let me run from it. I don't want to deal with this. Why? Because I'm afraid. I'm afraid. It is not anger. It is fear. And it's time for us to call those things what they are and let the devil know that we're not going to fall for his tricks any longer. I'm no longer going to run away. I'm going to do it afraid. Another response, you all, is the freeze response. The freeze response is to try to be very still and quiet until the danger passes. Because in all honesty, at that point, we don't know what to do, right? In the free response, what happens is, right, our amygdala is um, hyperactive and then our prefrontal cortex um, and our hippocampus, they're not at work at all. So, or very minimally, which means that we can't, we don't have logical thinking, we can't see the cause and effect, and we don't know what to do. Sometimes we experience selective mutism. Sometimes we can get no news so devastating. We can have an experience that is so anxiety provoking that we just freeze. We literally feel like our vocal cords become paralyzed and they're unable to speak until that anxiety passes. We need time to get back to the place where we can even talk or walk or move. This type of fear response shuts our bodies down. We feel frozen until the fear begins to subside. We feel numb, we dissociate. We don't reply, we don't listen, we stare off into space. We go into a whole you know, mental room where nobody can access us, that's the freeze. Cause I don't even know how to process this. I don't even know where to begin. I don't know if I should cry. I don't know if I should throw myself on the floor. I don't know if I should run away. I don't know what I should do. So I'm just gonna sit here. I'm just gonna sit here until something comes, right? These are familiar experiences with us for fear. But let me tell y'all the one that knocked my socks off, fawn. I had never heard of this before until I did this research a little earlier this year. The fawn response is our fear response when the brain decides to try and please whoever's triggering the fear response to prevent them from causing harm. Now, if we think about this particular response, we've seen this before, right? We know that this are people who are uh, people who are maybe being kidnapped or you know held hostage or put in a dangerous situation. They will be compliant and do whatever it is that they are needed to do in order to in, to try to minimize the um, harm that could come their way. They won't establish boundaries. They won't be assertive. They will they will be more uh, prone to codependency. They uh, will negotiate against themselves, right? The things that they'll give up just to try to stay in good graces with another person, going against their own beliefs, my God. Saying yes to everything, being a yes man, a yes woman. No boundaries. Y'all listen to this. Our brains are simply trying to keep us as safe as possible in those kind of situations. When I live in a perpetual state of trauma, it is very hard for me to have boundaries and have any value for self-care. Why is this? Because I just want to please someone else because I don't even know what pleasure looks like for myself. My God, help us today. So I'll say yes. I'll agree to things that I don't really want to agree to. I'll do anything it takes to not be hurt. I'm willing to comply. I'm willing to avoid. I'm willing to engage or all of the above just in order to keep somebody else happy. That's when we're in survivor mode. I hope you all can hear that these are the behaviors of survivors. Survivors engage in fight or flight or freeze or fawn. Why? Because their amygdala is always hyperactive. And so do they know this is what I need to do in God? I need to pray. I need to read the word. I need to fat. I know I need to fight, flight, freeze or fawn. And God is telling us, even in these responses, he gets no glory out of any of this. Because he wants us to be delivered from fear. And the only way that we can be delivered from fear is that we have to understand the impact that the fear has on us. Fear is a liar. Somebody type that in the chat. Fear is a liar because it's a spirit, saints of God. And anything that is not from God, we know where it's from, y'all. Come on, come on, somebody. Fear is a liar. And every lie comes from the father of lies. Fear is from the pits of hell. And I don't want to stay bound to fear any longer. We do not make the most effective choices when our amygdala is activated. That's the bottom line. When I'm in a state of perpetual fear, I don't make good choices. 
Living in fear will always cause us to miss the mark. Saints of God, what is it when we miss the mark? That is the black and white definition of sin. Living in perpetual states of fear will always cause me to sin. Fear is sin. Remaining in a status of fear is sin. I cannot do what God wants me to do if I maintain my position in fear. I read this morning in Pastor Joyce Meyer's book, Do It Afraid. She said that many of us have reason to be afraid, to be angry, to be bitter, but we don't have the right. I'm going to say that one more time so that will resonate in somebody's spirit. We have reason to be angry. We have a reason to be hurt. We have a reason to be uh, 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 bitter. We have a reason to be discontented, but we don't have the right. And this is why fear will lead us to sin. We're going to miss the mark when we say, I can stay here. So how do we get free? I'm going to wrap this thing up. How do I confront fear? First of all, I have to call it what it is. I have to recognize when I'm engaging in flight, fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. Then I have to recognize that that behavior, those actions, those thought processes, that emotional state of being, that is not from God. And last but not least, I have to speak into the atmosphere what God has given us. We know what the word of God says in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7. The apostle Paul, right, is speaking to Timothy and he tells Timothy to stir up the gifts. Why did the apostle Paul need to tell this to Timothy? Because Timothy as a young pastor was very reluctant about engaging in challenging conversations with the constituents of his ministry. He was challenged, he, he struggled, and he wanted to, not engage in those conversations, right? So there was fear that was holding him back from dealing with some of the contention and the strife that was flowing throughout his ministry. So the apostle Paul tells him, stir up the gift, meaning go and be bold, man of God. You've been anointed and appointed for such a time as this. Go do what I was, what you've been assigned to do by the power and authority given to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Do it afraid. You may be fearful, but do it afraid. Stir up the gift that's on the inside of you because that gift is stronger than your fear. And then he goes in to tell them, and then he goes in to tell them, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, right? These two scriptures go back and forth. Second Timothy uh, chapter one, verse six is to stir up the gift. Second Timothy chapter one, verse seven is to, uh, that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but that of power, love, and a sound mind. Why does he tell him this? Why does he tell him this? Because fear is a spirit. And anything that is not the Holy Spirit is not of God. So that's first and foremost. So when I recognize my fear, I rebuke that fear because that's a spirit that's not of God. And then I speak into the atmosphere what God has given me. God didn't give me fear. I rebuke that spirit of fear and I release into the atmosphere the power, love, and a sound mind that God has given me. What does power mean? The Greek word for power in the scriptures is dunamis. This definition messed me up. Dunamis power is my inherent power, the power on the inside of me. It's the power that resides in a thing by virtue of his nature. Y'all need to hear this tonight. Oh, glory to your name. The power that resides in me by virtue of my nature, that I was made in the likeness and image of God. I have power. Oh my God, Uh, or which a person or thing exerts or puts forth power for performing miracles. That's how I can do it afraid because it's a miracle that my emotions are not going to drive me away, but drive me toward because I've got power. Somebody needs to declare tonight, I've got power. Oh, I've got power. Uh, The power and influence uh, which belongs to riches and wealth. Uh, I'm a king's kid. Uh, I'm a royal priesthood. I'm Uh, I'm a part of a chosen generation. Uh, Therefore, I have power and influence. Uh, That's why I can do it, uh, because I've got the power. Uh, I have power as of armies, uh, forces, and hosts. Uh, I got so much power that lives on the inside of me uh, that it can defeat armies. Uh, I've got power on the inside of me uh, 
that can tear down strongholds. Uh, I've got power on the inside of me uh, that will go before me and I'll never have to fight. Oh, uh, If I understand who I am, uh, that just by virtue of who I am uh, and whose I am uh, and whose image and likeness I've been created in, uh, I have the power to overcome fear. Oh, uh, I don't have to live under the shroud of fear. Uh, not one more day in the name of Jesus. I have a spirit of love, uh, which means I have charity, affection. Uh, I don't care that my mama didn't hug me uh, or my daddy didn't kiss me. Uh, I can still be that for my children. Uh, the generational curse stops with me. Uh, oh, glory to your name in the name of Jesus. I can be charitable. Uh, I can give uh, because I don't live in perpetual fear about where my next thing is coming from uh, because I know that everything I need, God will supply uh, because I believe him in his word when he says in Matthew 6 uh, that he cares for the birds, uh, that he cares for the flowers of the field. Uh, and if he cares for them, how much more does he care for me? Uh, so I don't have to worry about my tomorrow. Uh, I can worry about my today uh, and know that it's taken care of so I can give. Uh, I can give and know that it shall be given unto me. Uh, pressed down, shaken together and running over shall men pour into my bosom. I can give to you because somebody else going to bring it to me because that's what the Bible says. Uh, I can live with the power of love. Oh, shout out Mando Robo, see, uh -huh. because that's what God said I have. Uh I can live with the power of a sound mind. Huh? What does that mean? Huh? I have the peace of mind. Huh? Even amidst the calamity, huh? I can still have peace in my mind huh? and the capacity to make good decisions. Huh? Yes, I've lived huh? with an agitated amygdala, amygdala all my life. Huh? Yes, I've been in fear. Huh? Yes, I've been in trauma. Huh? Yes, I've had these experiences, but, but, but God. Huh? But God will give me the power huh? to have peace of mind huh? and the ability to make good decisions. Huh? I can live with self-control. Uh, I don't got to get in everybody's bed. Uh, I don't got to pick up every drink. Uh, I don't got to answer that phone call. Uh, I can live with self-control. Uh, I don't have to eat myself and eat that pint of ice cream. Somebody help me today. Uh, and I got to recognize the fear. Uh, I got to recognize it. Uh, I got to recognize it. Because when I recognize it, uh, I recognize that it's not from God and I can rebuke it. Uh, and then I can release into the atmosphere what I am and what I have. Uh, I have power. Uh, I have love. Uh, I have a sound mind. Uh, and you know what? I can do it afraid. Uh, God has given us the capacity, saints of God, uh, to do some things afraid. Uh, and it is time for us uh, to declare that the stronghold of fear uh, is destroyed. Not broken, saints, uh, but destroyed. Because things that are broken can be fixed, my first lady says. Uh, but when it's destroyed, you all, uh, it has no capacity to return back to its former state. Uh, so I want and I declare and decrees under the sound of my voice uh, in the name of Jesus for those of us that have been battling fear, uh, that the fear is destroyed off of our lives. Uh, even now, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Uh, oh, glory to your name. Can we give the Lord a hand clap of praise uh, that the spirit, uh, that the spirit of fear is destroyed uh, and that we'll never be bound again. Uh, we'll never be bound again. I'm going to do it afraid. If you haven't said that yet, declare to the atmosphere, I'm going to do it afraid. I'm going to preach afraid. I'm going to teach afraid. I'm going back to school afraid. I'm applying for that new job afraid. I'm leaving my job to start this business afraid. But I'm going to do it afraid in Jesus. Somebody here needed to know that they can do this thing afraid. And this is the word of the Lord unto you tonight. And I pray that it resonates with somebody's spirit and that the strongholds are destroyed even now in the name name of Jesus. Pastor, I turn it back over to your hands uh, in Jesus' mighty name. Do it afraid, saints. Ho shatamaya in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 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 Um, it's so funny. Even before the service even started, uh, me and Dr. Bullens were backstage and I said, you know, fear is the greatest, I mean, the greatest paralyzer Fear is the greatest paralyzer. So today we are telling fear, I'm going to do it afraid. I'm going to get on my course. I'm going to do it no matter what the test. I'm giving it on to God right now. Hallelujah. God, I'm giving it to you right now, God. No matter what has come up against me, I know who's but behind me. I know who's behind me. No matter how much people are in front of me, I know there's more with me than is against me right now. Hallelujah, God. I give it to you. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.
Glory to God today. Just give God the praise. Just give him the praise. And you are you are declaring right now. We are in a season of declaration. I am going to do it afraid. Hallelujah. I'm just going to go right into prayer. God, thank you right now. Thank you for the spirit of fear and to giving us to understand that it's only with you can we do this. It's only with you, God, is we can do this. I seen something on fake on Facebook today and I actually shared it. It said, it said, I confidence, the art of knowing that it's only through there, through God can I do things. So right now I'm walking with the confidence. I'm walking with confidence right now. God, I want you to give me the spirit of courage. I want you to give me the spirit of courage, being able to look a fear straight in the eye and tell him, fear you have no power over me. Hallelujah, God. God, I want you to give us that spirit of, of Daniel, that spirit of David, that spirit of everybody who's seen something that bigger, stronger, that could have took them out, but understood that with you, God, I can kill some giants. Hallelujah. With you, God, I can sleep with lions. Hallelujah. With you, God, I can be in a furnace, God. Hallelujah. It's only through you, God that we find this confidence. It's only with you, God, that we find this. Hallelujah. In your name we pray. <laughs> Hallelujah. Dr. Burns, do you just want to give us the um, the closest benediction? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thanks to God, I just pray tonight. I pray tonight that you've heard something that will rattle your spirit, something for you to pray about. Ask God to show you the areas of your lives where you've operated with fear and not recognize, right, that stronghold of fear that has been over your thoughts, over how you see things, right, your perception of things, your actions, your speech. Ask God to reveal those things to you in this season because this is our season to be free. I declare it and decree in the name of Jesus that we're free from fear. We're completely and totally free from fear. The bondage of fear is obliterated in the name of Jesus. We are a free people that are going to move forward in the fear and the the admonition of the Lord in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Good night, everybody. We love you guys intentionally on purpose. Join us again tomorrow, same time, same place, uh, 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Have a good night, everybody.